Hello and welcome to the Crisis Point Podcast. I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started on today's podcast, I just want to remind everybody to like and subscribe to the channel wherever you listen to us, wherever you watch us. We're on YouTube and Odyssey now uh, as far as the video. And of course, we're on all the different podcast uh, platforms, wherever you listen to your podcast, please make sure you subscribe to our channel. We really appreciate it. Also, I just want, I've been reminding people that uh, everybody's getting kicked off of big tech these days, and I imagine we will be too at some point. And so make sure you follow us, not just at um, on Twitter and, and Facebook, but also different places. We're basically, we're at Crisis Mag everywhere. Uh, so Twitter, at Gitter, uh, Gab, Par- Parlor Float, you name it, we're, we're there and uh, just Crisis Mag. So make sure you follow us wherever that might be. Uh, finally, just uh, please uh, donate if you can. We appreciate that. Uh, crisismagazine.com slash donate. Okay, so we have a great show today. We have uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, who is here for the second time on Crisis Point. We had a great discussion. I think it was almost eight or nine months ago about the booming traditional mo- movement, which, of course, things have changed since then, but <laughs> we won't get into that as much today. We're going to talk about some other stuff. But let me just introduce him for those who aren't aware of who uh, Dr. Kwasniewski is. He received his BA in liberal arts from Thomas Aquinas College, an MA and PhD in philosophy from the Catholic University of America. He taught philosophy and theology at the International Theological Institute in Austria and music for the Franciscan University of Steubenville's Austrian program, and he later helped found Wyoming Catholic College. Uh, He's now a freelance author, public speaker, editor, publisher, and composer, and his, Peter's output is just, I mean, it it makes the rest of us editors and writers just, you know, envious. I mean, it's unbelievable. He has published over 1,300 articles. I was impressed that I had like 150 or something, but he's got over 1,300 articles, both academic and popular. This That's important. It's it, like all levels uh, on sacramental liturgical theology, the aesthetics of music, Thomistic thought, and the social doctrine of church. His articles have been translated in at least 14 languages. Also, that's pretty cool. Uh, you written or edited, and I th- I'm making a guess here because your website is not updated. It still says 10, but I think it's 14 books. Does that sound right? Uh, it, it, it's it's a question of like ones that I've written versus ones that I've edited. So okay. the, the, the it's 10 is about right for the ones that I've written myself. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So we'll, we'll just stick with 10 for, for how, that you've written. And including uh, your most recently published book, uh, which is Ministers of Christ. And I have it right here. Recovering the roles of clergy and laity in an age of confusion. I'll put it up on the screen for people can see a little bit better. So yeah, ministers of Christ recovering the roles of clergy and laity in an age of confusion. So first of all, welcome to the program, Peter. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Eric. It's always good to see you. And yeah, happy to great you seeing you. I, I just I'm I'm just so impressed by this, uh, all the stuff you're able to put out. It's, it's just great. Now this one I'm particularly impressed with this book for the reason that is a response to a uh, papal motu proprio that was issued back in January, so less than a year ago. And this was written and published within a year. And for those of us who have been published by different publishers, we know how long this can take. However, I will make the plug. This was a crisis publications book. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, that's why one reason I was able to get out a little quicker. Uh, but, but basically, this was the motu proprio Spiritus Domini which it modified Canon 230, uh, Article 1 of the Code of Canon Law regarding access of women to the ministers of lector and acolyte. And what I want to do is, and I know people listening might be like, okay, you've kind of lost me there. What what is he talking about? We're going to get into this detail, but I want to first just lay out what kind of spurred this on. And I want to read what the canon says. It's originally what it said before the change. It said, lay men who possess the age and qualifications established by decree of the Conference of Bishops can be admitted on a stable basis through the prescribed liturgical right to the ministries of lector and acolyte. So why don't we just start by you explaining what this canon means, what it's talking about, and then how it was changed. Sure. I mean, in order to do that, I do have to give a thumbnail sketch of the back history of this question, right? So... In the tradition of the church, um, starting very early on, the first records we have are from the third century, which implies that it probably goes back to the apostles and our Lord himself, since the records in the early centuries are kind of scattered that way. 
Um, but from very early on, we have in the Catholic Church, and this is true in East and West, we have various office, uh, various orders of clergy, of clerics, um, not just bishops, not just priests, not just deacons, but also subdeacons, and then acolytes, lectors, porters, and exorcists. So these are the these are what are called those are the four minor orders. The three major orders are subdeacon, deacon, and priest. And then the bishop is is the one who's supremely He's like the high priest who's in charge of, of everyone else. And that's a structure that still exists in the East. And it existed in the West all the way into the mid 1970s. So that's a really long you know, career for the for these orders. OK, and all of these all of the men who were going to be made clerics were ordained to those different positions. Obviously, these ordinations were of different kinds. We wouldn't say the ordination to acolyte is the same kind of ordination as that of a priest or a deacon. There are differences, important differences. The, the deacon and the priest receive a sacramental ordination. It's a sacrament, uh, and it changes them ontologically. It changes their being, uh, whereas the lower ministries are deputed by the church for certain functions in the liturgy. So they have a, a kind of special blessing from the church, and they're empowered by God to do that with his grace. So that's the basic structure you're dealing with. Now, Paul VI in 1974 decided, as he did with so many other things, he decided to dismantle that structure and to replace the minor orders in the subdiaconate with two ministries, instituted ministries, he called them, namely acolyte, which is like a glorified word for altar server, and lector, which is another word for reader, but we all say lector, so we know what that means. Um, and these two instituted ministries, he, Paul VI kind of detached them from this whole structure, this hierarchical structure that had existed in the church for nearly 2,000 years. Um, and, and he just made them these kind of free-floating, you know, things that lay people could, could do. They, they didn't, that lay men specifically could do, men. Um, and that was very clear in Paul VI's legislation. Now, was that, when, when Paul VI changed it, was were, were they was there some type of ordination right still at that point because there was i know with the previously but with the, these two kind of revised ones did was there actually technically an uh, uh, ordination no. right no no so so what what happens is that that it's really a kind of prayer service in which the bishop says some prayers and and you know and says the church is now giving you this responsibility so it's a it's a it's a it's a weak kind of deputation okay um but it still means something canonically it exists in canon law and it has certain consequences to it for example if you are a an acolyte or a lector officially you know uh, that is instituted by the church by the bishop then when you are present in church, you're supposed to exercise that, that function. You're not just supposed to sit back and twiddle your thumbs while somebody else goes and does it. Um, and similarly with, with uh, you know, so-called extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, and I'm not even gonna get into the problems with that, but if there are extraordinary ministers, then the, the instituted acolytes are supposed to be the ones who first fulfill that function. So there are consequences to it. It's not an empty uh, title. But it certainly isn't the minor orders of yesterday. And and no. the, the, also, I'm just going to say, though, like most people, though, I, you said there's a, a prayer service associated with those two orders or whatever we want to call them at this point. Uh, but I think most people never like lectors. Let's just stick with lectors. Like I've read it uh, at, at mass before years ago. I never went through any prayer service to do that. And like, I think most of the people, obviously the women, you know, haven't, if it was only for laymen, but so was this just something that like nobody actually did? It's just like, yes. so, yeah. So then that's the next level of the question is Paul, the sixth, you know, created these instituted ministries, but they, and, and it seemed like the idea was that they should spread throughout the church. But in fact, they only ever existed with the rarest of exceptions in seminaries. So seminarians were instituted as acolytes and lectors in a kind of echo of the old approach of seminaries where they would all receive the minor orders and the subdiaconate before they received the diaconate. Um, but it, it really existed only in seminaries. And, uh, and so what happened in most parish situations, 99.9% .9 of the time, is that you simply had lay people coming up from the congregation who were just put on a schedule or something who volunteered to read or to serve. 
And those people are not instituted ministers. They're, they're simply ad hoc uh, volunteers who substitute for ministers, okay? Um, and, and in fact, we have to just be honest about this and say that happens a, a great deal, that happened a great deal in the old days, and it still happens with the traditional mass, that we don't typically have acolytes uh, serving in the sanctuary. Some people might use that word because they like the fancy sound of it, but an acolyte is an ordained minister, and an altar boy is just an altar boy. He's substituting for an acolyte. Okay. So when you have the cute little boys up there doing everything, that's fine. That's allowed by the church but they are substituting for proper ordained ministers, okay? Uh, and so in a way, this, this question is complicated because it's not as if the church prior to Vatican II was using all ordained ministers. Uh, and then afterwards, suddenly we, we threw that out. For a long time, we were using substitutes. Uh, and so in a way, one can understand perhaps Paul VI was trying to just regularize and, and maybe what Paul VI was doing is instead of trying to revive the minor orders and make them more important again, which is what reform really should look like, return to form, as Martin Mosbach says, instead of doing that, he said, oh, well, you know what? People don't really take those as seriously anymore. So let's just, let's just chuck them out and do something else. Um, but, and, and even the, and even the something else he did, never really took off right, except right. within seminaries. So the um, ideal before Vatican II, before Paul VI made these changes, let's just say that, it, for those two ministries, for lector and acolyte, is that, let's say in a seminary situation where you have lots of young men in seminary, you would ordain, you know, first of all, which one comes first, acolyte or lector, like in the order of things? Oh, that's a good question. I, saw, I, I actually forget which one comes okay. first. But, but they're... Those two are the most important of them. Right. Uh, but the idea, though, is that the people serving like the altar, the people serving at the altar would at least be acolytes in the ideal situation. Yes. Let's say something right. And only person re doing a reading, like, for example, from what we call kind of the first reading, the epistle, uh, would be a lector, at least a lector. Correct. Right. In so, the ideal situation. But like you said, even before Paul VI made changes. It, you know, I think in most cases, weren't just priests, the, the, the celebrating priests reading the, 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 the epistles. Yes. And, and see, that's the other thing we have to bear in mind is that in the old days, uh, and I mean, certainly right up to the Second Vatican Council, and even a little bit afterwards, uh, you would have a much fuller liturgical life at a seminary or at a monastery than you would have at a typical parish, right? with the exception of like Westminster Cathedral or, or some, you know, some kind of great place that had grand liturgy all the time. And so in a seminary or a monastery, you have a, you have a lot of men available for liturgy and they're, and that's the main point of their day. That's the, that's the high point of their day. And especially in a monastery, right? It's the Opus Dei. It's, it's the very, you know, it's the very heart of what they're there for. And so in those situations, you definitely had ordained acolytes, ordained lectors, you know, every, everything was being done quite properly uh, as it should be. And, you know, it's interesting, the Council of Trent, way back in the 16th century, it actually said in the reform decrees on the uh, holy orders, it said, we need to revive the minor orders and increase their, their numbers, even at the parish level. Uh, and and to me, fascinatingly, the council even says, if, if unmarried clerics are not available, suitable married men should be ordained to the minor orders and made clerics so that they can fulfill these functions. So the, the Council of Trent was, you know, was kind of, uh, you know, cutting, cutting edge for that day. You know, they, right, right, right. They, they wanted to have, they really wanted to have ordained ministers doing everything in the sanctuary. But that didn't really happen, right? I mean, it wasn't like there was some massive number of married men who were being ordained to those minor orders, correct? No, there, there wasn't. And, and you know, the, I mean, the Council of Trent, like every council, it had lots of great ideas, but some of them never took off. And then right. it had some lousy ideas, too. I mean, not very many of them. But, <laughs> but, but for example, it talked about how there should be a commentator at the liturgy who explains things to people. I mean, that's, that's a horrible idea. And, and it never took off. Like, well, you get John Madden up there, like giving the play by play. Of the liturgy. Uh, and, and it's funny because in the, in the liturgical movement in the, in the thirties, forties, uh, you know, people like Bunini, they loved that idea of having a commentator. And so they would often have somebody during mass, like reading out little scripted, you know, descriptions, like the priest is doing this now. And, you know, we should, we should do this. And, 
you know, and so That's crazy. I never heard of that. <laughs> I didn't know. So even, you know, just, I mean, just because the council of Trent was in my, in my opinion, the, the greatest council ever in church history, um, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, even, even good Homer nods sometimes as the saying goes. Right, right. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to vote for Nicaea, but okay. We'll give you a chance. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go back then. So Paul instituted these two, he abolished basically the minor orders and he established these two ministries, Lecter and Acolyte, 1974, he said. So a few years after the Novus Ordo had been promulgated and was in practice, about four years after that. And so that that was the status. But nobody really followed that. I mean, around the world, nobody's really following that. It basically, what we know of today is what happened was basically volunteers of either men or women were lectors. And then obviously the, we have the whole issue of altar girls and, and serving at the altar and stuff that, which also ended up became, becoming de facto, mm -hmm. but yet in Canon law, which this Canon law was probably, this was 1984, right? 83, 83. Okay. 1983. It states lay men who possess the age and qualifications. They can go through a prescribed liturgical right to the ministries of lector and acolyte. Yes. And so that makes it clear that there is a liturgical right for it, like you said, almost like a prayer service and lay men. And it does say men, so only men. But then Pope Francis issued this motu proprio in January. And what it what basically my understanding is he just changed men to persons. Is it more than that? Yeah, I mean, well, what, what he was clear, what he clearly was doing, and this was explained by the Vatican, is he was opening up these instituted ministries to women, okay. as well as men. Uh, so instead of it just being volunteer substitutes, which is what most people are accustomed to, uh, he wanted to create a formal, official liturgical ministry for women. Okay. Uh, and that's the first time that any pope has ever done some, something like that. Um, and so either, you know, I mean, there are various points that one could make about this move. Um, but the one thing that seems really clear is that it's one more example of a novelty, of a clear departure from tradition. I mean, what Paul VI did was already a departure from tradition, but he tried to keep, as I said, a kind of echo or a a tenuous connection right. by saying these are official ministries that must be fulfilled by men. So in a sense, like, like quasi clerics, right. And what Francis is doing is, is kind of severing that last link and saying, okay, these are just wide open now to men and women. And yet they're still official liturgical ministries in the sanctuary. They're still, um, they're still, they're still like quasi clerics in that sense. Right. Um, so it's confusing because it's it's either confusing the notion of what ministry is in the sanctuary or it's it's, um, you know, I mean, it, it, or it's just sort of evacuating the concept of ministry of any particular sacral uh, identity and, and function and status. Um, so whatever it's doing, it seems like a kind of dilution and a kind of egalitarianism, uh, which which, you know, to be a little cynical sounding, it, it kind of sounds like a bone thrown to the feminists. Like right. you'll never be priests. I'm not, you know, we're never going to ordain you priests, even though that's what you really want, you know, and maybe even women bishops like the Episcopalians or whatever, you know, that's what you really want. You're never going to get it. Um, you want to be deacons. You're probably not going to get that either, but at least we can make you acolytes and lectors officially, right. you know, and, and so you should be content with that. Yeah. Which um, is kind of what it sounds like, but all, which is also incredibly insulting. <laughs> well, it, it is insulting because because the the well, be, because fundamentally, and this is where this is the point of my book or one of the points of my book, it has multiple points, um, is that we need to sort of step back from this this pressure cooker situation that feminism has created, where it's always pushing women into the next field. You know, they have to be firemen, they have to be police officers, they have to be soldiers, they have to shoot people, they have to, you know, whatever, whatever the field is that used to be done by men, the women now have to do it, you know, um, and, and vice versa. Of course, there's so much gender confusion, sexual confusion. It's just, it's, a, it's an epidemic at this point. Uh, you know, forget about COVID. That's nothing. You know, we, we have a we have a sexual identity crisis here. Uh, and so what I what I'm arguing is we have to step back and say, whoa, wait a minute. Do we even do we even understand what how the liturgy works? What minute what is a minister? What is a cleric in the liturgy? What's his function? Um, and, and, and what is the relationship between the clergy and the laity? 
and and then within the laity, what's the relationship between man and woman? How is that complementarity supposed to work out in real everyday life? You know, right. And if if we look at these questions uh, more sympathetically and and with the depth of the Catholic tradition, we can see that this whole direction that Francis has been going in, and also I think Paul the Sixth, they're they're based on some very some very fundamental anthropological and ecclesiological errors right. um, that, that really show a confusion about what the liturgy is and, and what our roles are. Yeah. And talking about taking a step back, y- y- the title of the book is Ministers of Christ. And I think the word ministry is one in which there's a lot of confusion. I worked for a bishop for a number of years and to his credit, he hated using the term ministry with associated with lay people. Mm-hmm. He was very, uh, he was very clear that lay people do apostolates and clergy do ministries. And he was right. saying just in general, right. he just didn't like the term lay ministry. But man, he just got hammered because of that. And people, yes. you know, most lay people, some good nature leads some more ideologically. They just don't get like, why couldn't I, like I do ministry? I'm I'm the catechist. I, I do this. I'm the youth minister or whatever. Sure. Sure. But what is that right. really? What do we mean as Catholics when we say ministry? Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's the problem with a lot of terms, right? There are equivocal terms that can be taken in different, uh, in different senses. So, you know, you have like the hospitality ministry or whatever, like right. we make the cookies or something. I mean, okay, right. fine. Well, it, in a, in a super extended meaning of the word, it can just mean any kind of service. Right. right. I mean, and, and even the word diaconia from which we get the word deacon means service, right. It is a pretty generic word. Uh, right. so of course, generic words can be taken in all sorts of ways. Um, however, in the, in the, in the history and the tradition of the church, ministerium uh, and 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 the the, the the it has a more specific meaning has a more definite meaning uh, and the meaning of it is a servant in the liturgy who stands in the place of Christ the supreme servant right um, and so basically what we're talking about here is by another name a cleric someone ordained someone set aside and given a certain order, an ordo, a position uh, within the liturgy of the church um, and exercising it in the name of Christ and as a kind of representative of Christ. In, there's an in persona Christi aspect uh, to every one of the ministries, every one of the, the real ministries that we talk about in terms of the liturgy. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, obviously the priest, the priest, acts most of all in persona Christi, because he's the one who consecrates the body and blood. And he even says, this is my body. He's speaking as if he were Christ himself, right? And with the power to speak those words and to effect transubstanti- transubstantiation. Um, but every minister, even the acolyte, even the the, the altar server who's holding the, the wine and the water, right, is participating in the diaconia, the, the, the servanthood of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, as it says in the gospel, right? So what we're really, the, the root question and the thing that I, I kind of drill into in my book is what I call incarnational realism, right? That is to say, every, every minister in the sanctuary should represent Christ to us in a very visible way, in an incarnate way, not just abstractly, like, oh yeah, conceptually, that person is doing some kind of service, but concretely, there's a there's a kind of image of Christ, the high priest, present in all of the, in the whole um, unfolding of the liturgy. Why? Because the liturgy is the prayer of Christ the priest. That's what it is first and foremost and essentially. Right. It's not just this kind of like random prayer that everybody happens to be doing together. It's the prayer of Christ. And so the ministers who are acting on his behalf and offering this prayer with him and for us and with us should be men. They should be males. Right. This is the 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 church has never, ever had any other understanding than that the liturgy is offered by Christ and by those who are configured to Christ. Um, So that's that's kind of the root issue here that that a lot of Catholics just ignore, right? Or they don't even know, they don't even think about it. Right. Cause if you go to like your typical parish these days, everything, almost everything about it speaks against what you just said. The architecture, the fact that there's no delineation often between the sanctuary and the nave. In fact, you know, and, and then the fact that there's uh, like you said, everybody traps up there for 
you know, as Eucharistic ministers, men and women, mm-hmm. usually predominantly women, mm-hmm. and that it just a uh, it, everything about that says the opposite of what you're saying that it's just yeah. this egalitarian just communal meal and we're just getting together not a prayer of christ not the sacrifice of christ yes and i yes. do think there's a real i still i do think that there's a lot of very good-natured catholics who <laughs> hear the language of it has to be a man to be configured to christ in the way you say and automatically just have a knee-jerk reaction that that's sexist that that's somehow Mm-hmm. anti-woman, something like that. How do we explain this in a way that that they would understand this is not going against women in any way, but this, you know, we're being faithful to Christ. Christ only selected men as apostles. I know that, but yes. yet at the same time, how do we explain this in a way that I think that your typical good, I mean, we're not talking about the crazy feminists. They're not going to accept it, but just the sure. good natured Catholic would accept it. Well, I mean, to, to me, you know, Ever, ever since I experienced the miracle of, of having children and seeing children born and seeing my wife, you know, be the mother of, of our children. Um, I mean, that, that's just been for me, it, it's, I, and I think for a lot of women too, um, it's a sort of revolutionary experience that turns upside down a lot of your cultural assumptions about what's really important. And, um, you know, to me, I, I can't imagine something more false, and I'm even going to say more satanically false than to denigrate motherhood as the vocation of a woman, as the unique, irreplaceable, singular vocation of a woman. No man can do that. No priest can be a mother. Why can't a priest be a mother? That's so sexist. It's incredible, isn't it? No, of course not. And so, yeah, and and, and so the, the, the fact that um, not every woman is a mother, but but many, most women will be mothers. And the work that they have and that vocation, it's really a calling and it's a, it's a, a form of sacrificial love. You know, that is more important to the human race and to the church and even to our image of the church as mother, right, than anything that men can do, anything that men can do, okay? Certainly on a natural level, that's true. Right. I mean, on a supernatural level, there are things that the church does for us that neither men nor women can do, like baptism and confirmation and uh, and confession and so on. But I mean, on a natural level, right, what the woman right. does is absolutely is unique and irreplaceable. Um, and feminism does such an injustice to women by convincing them that they need to think about themselves as men. They need to compete with men. They need to be just as good as men. That's absurd. Be a good woman. Be a be a woman to the fullest extent. Right. And that's what that's what men need, and that's what women need, right? Um, and the same thing can be said, of course, of men. Men need to be virile and not effeminate, right? We have such a plague of effeminacy and and cowardice and passivity and laziness, and just there are many many vices that men have um, because they're not being manly, because they're not actually living up to their manhood, right? And so, I think that part of this part of the solution to the crisis in the church is just to try to recover a healthy, I'm going to say the word anthropology, a a healthy understanding of human nature and the inherent duality of human nature. There is no such thing as a human being. There's a man and a woman. That's it. That's all you ever get, right? Right. Uh, And, you know, and, and Mary, the mother of God, I talk about this in the book too. She is the supreme human person. There is no human person higher than Our Lady. Because, of course, our Lord is not a human person. He's a divine person with a human nature, right? So he's man. He's true man, but he's not a human person, right? A person means, you know, that's kind of where the buck stops. Uh, There's nothing higher in us than the person. So Mary is the highest human person. um, And Christ, of course, is the son of God. He's a divine person. So in terms of, like, the perfection of human nature, right, we're going to find the perfection of male human nature in Christ and of female human nature in the Virgin Mother of God, right? Who And she and her own in her own femininity, in her own womanhood, she exemplifies the two greatest roles of the woman, mother and virgin, right? These are incompatible in any individual except her by, by, by a divine grace, by a divine miracle. Um, but she, you know, she shows self-giving love to the fullest extent, which takes two forms, either in the form of, of marriage and motherhood or the form of virginity. And Our Lady is the one blessed to unite those two in a miraculous way, right? I also think that this... I feel like the church, by by caving into all of this, and it really does seem to me like it's just a caving into culture. 
Mm -hmm. uh, particularly Western culture, I should say. I feel like we've undercut our ability to now fight the deadly consequences of this. And we're talking all the way to like transgenderism. Yes. And this idea that men and women are basically interchangeable. And I can just say I'm a woman today or tomorrow. I'm a man. There's like no mm -hmm. real meaning behind it. And when a, when a priest tries to get up at mass and in a homily tries to say, talk about the distinctions between men and women, how they really do matter. Everything around him though, is probably speaking against what he's saying. And of course yes. we learn a lot more from that yes. than we do from words. And exactly. I just, I felt that for a while now that a, a young person who goes to mass every week and he just has altar boys up there, you know, just has men up there. But yet at the parish, women are like when they have babies, it's the biggest deal in the world, you know, in a good parish. Mm -hmm. Those things, I think, teach that young person, whether they're male or female, you know, there really are not only are there differences, but they matter. They're important. Those differences yes. between them. Yeah, And I just want to pick up on some comments you were making earlier about church architecture. Um, what, what we have to recognize, uh, and again, I go into this in the book, is that the, the, the way that churches were built and again, this is universally true, Eastern Christians, Western Christians, any kind of Christians, uh, up until very recently, um, always built their churches in, with symbolic partitions and symbolic segmentation. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, the most basic segmentation of a church is into the sanctuary or the apse. That's where the liturgy takes place. That's where the sacrifice of Christ is offered. Then the nave of the church, which is the large gathering area for the people, for the congregation. And then finally, the atrium or the entranceway, which is, which is, is, you know, in most churches, that's covered. That's an enclosed space. And it's, and it had a very important function, especially in ancient Christianity, because that's where the catechumens and the penitents had to hang out. They couldn't go into the nave, right? They weren't, they weren't worthy to go into the nave. Only baptized faithful can go into the nave. And once you're in the nave, you're in the body of Christ. You know, you're fully within the body. It's like being in the heart of the church. But the heart is not the head, right? The head of the church, Christ, is symbolized by the apse, by the sanctuary. And that's where the ministers are. That's where the clergy are who represent Christ, right? They're not in the congregation. They're in the sanctuary. Um, and there was usually a barrier or partition, right? In, in Eastern churches, this is called the iconostasis. Uh, and it's very important for them. And sometimes it's such a barrier that you can't see beyond it at all, right? So you can't even see what the clergy are doing uh, in, the, in the sanctuary. But in the West, um, you know, we, we, it's taken many forms. Sometimes there were curtains there separating the nave from the sanctuary. Sometimes there was something called a rood screen, which is like a, it's really a, a neat structure. I wish we had them again. You know, it's, it's like a, a kind of like a see-through chancel screen um, with often topped by a rood, that is to say a cross with, with, with John and Mary standing at the foot of the cross, right? Um, and so, you know, there's just a profound meaning to all of these divisions because what, what the church was trying to teach the people through the very building itself without any words is we're on a journey, we're on a pilgrimage and we enter the church through the atrium, just like we, we have to, you know, we first start out as pagans and sinners. We have to be baptized. You know, we have to confess our sins. And then we, we, we keep moving through the church along the axis of the nave. Uh, and heaven is what is represented by the apse of the church. And that's why in most churches, there was some kind of, you know, glowing golden dome, a mosaic, you know, with, with the image of Christ, the savior, or with some kind of heavenly image of angels. Right. And the point was we're on a pilgrimage to heaven and the liturgy represents our foretaste and our participation in heaven, but we're not there yet. Right. So it would be totally unfitting and it would be symbolically contradictory for lay people to just walk up from the nave into the sanctuary. That's like, that's Pelagian. That's massively Pelagian, but it's like saying we can just seize heaven for ourselves instead of having to receive the gifts of God from the clergy who come forth from the sanctuary and bring them to the people in the nave, right? For example, when they bring Holy Communion. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. it's the, and, and all of this, right, it, it, it may sound sophisticated, but like every illiterate peasant in the world understood these things because they're actually easy to understand when you're in the context of a beautiful, great church that follows this traditional architecture. And when you're in the middle of a traditional liturgy where all of these things are, 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 are clearly, you know, at work, 
and you do that over and over and over again, it, it forms you, it teaches you without even the need for tedious, you know, didactic discourses, right? right. So let me just make one last point about this because I'm on a roll. Uh, <laughs> you are. <laughs> so, so when I say that the clergy represent Christ, the high priest, what I mean by that is, you know, when the readings are being read, they were traditionally read by clergy because Christ is the author of the word and he's the one who's giving the word to us. And similarly, when the, the, when the, the consecrated host is given to us in communion, it's the priest, it's Christ who's feeding us, right? Christ does everything for us. That's the message of the traditional liturgy. Uh, again, any liturgy, Byzantine, Tridentine, doesn't matter what you're talking about. Um, and so when you have lay people, especially when they get up from the nave, go into the sanctuary and turn around and start giving things back to us, whether it's the word or the flesh of, of God, uh, it, it completely throws that whole thing off. It makes it's a Protestant notion that the lay people enjoy the same status as the as as the clergy in that sense, right? I mean, right. we're not saying we're not saying we're not claiming technically that that's true, but that's the symbolism. That's what that's what we're saying with our body language when we do these things, right? right? And when we institute a liturgical rite for it, it does seem to also make that true. And and what you were saying made me think of, okay, so. It's something you bring up in the book, the, the idea of passivity, the idea of activism, the idea of uh, active participation. And it reminded me of a number of years ago. Uh, this is now over over a decade ago. I was in uh, with one of my daughters for her first communion, like day, day retreat. It's like, OK, she's going to receive her first communion. And they had one uh, a woman who was I think she was the assistant to the DRE or something like that was teaching. And she was saying something to the effect, uh, she basically said that uh, we receive in the hand because we're not babies anymore to receive mm -hmm. like, you know, baby receives on the tongue. You know, they you they get fed. We receive on the um, hand. And I was a little bit taken aback by it because I knew the pastor was fine with us receiving on the tongue. And I had taught my kids from the beginning, you receive on the tongue. This is before I was going to traditional Latin Mass. It was a Nova Sordo parish this years ago. But the, the point is that we've always done on the tongue. And I, it didn't, it kind of threw me. So I didn't know what to say at the time. But then I, after I had a tradition, I would take them out to lunch after we did this little morning <laughs> retreat. And so I took my daughter out to lunch. You know, she's eight years old. So I'm trying to think, okay, how am I going to tell her, okay, this lady's wrong. And I said, you know how she said that when we receive on the tongue, it's like we're like babies, we're, we're being fed. And, but, you know, instead we should be on the hand. I said, but that's exactly what it is. Yes. We are receiving yes, yes, yes. as babies because exactly. I said, Jesus Christ is, you know, I mean, our God is our father. He is treating us like we should be treated, which is like babies. We're passively receiving. That's a good thing. So, exactly. you know, exactly. and so I, I thought of that with what you were just saying, that there is this passivity to the, the, the purpose of the lady, which isn't, a negative. Right. Well, let me just say that, I mean, even scripture says, right, in the Psalms, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Right. right. So the, the way in which communion is given in any traditional rite, Eastern or Western, I'm sorry, I, I know that sounds like my constant refrain, but I always have to remind people of that, is it's always placed into the mouth of the communicant by a cleric, by uh, an ordained minister who represents Christ. Um, and so really it's, it's God feeding us with himself. Could we ever feed ourselves with God? That's completely right. beyond our power. We can't do that. And so it's not surprising that the, you know, if the early church practiced communion in the hand and, and there's evidence that it happened, but in a different way than we do it now. And I talked about that extensively in my other book, the Holy Bread of Eternal Life. Um, nevertheless, there's a good reason why the church changed its practice because with time and the realization of what we're about, what we're doing and the sacredness of it and the danger of having people just take the take communion and possibly dropping it or losing right. fragments of it or something like that. And the church fathers are very clear about this, you know, that you have to be absolutely careful about even the least fragment, right? I mean, that's why the church eventually went only to giving communion to people in the mouth, right? For practical reasons and for symbolic reasons, right? I mean, and you find that, by the way, in the traditional liturgy, in, in every respect, the things that are done, that were done traditionally by the church and are still done in some places, they make sense practically and they make sense symbolically, right? Um, they always have that double kind of functionality to them. But speak a little bit then about the passive, like the... Yeah. Obviously, we all know active participation was the code phrase 
for a whole host of abuses and a whole host yeah. of changes yeah. and things like that. And there's this assumption that we are supposed to actively participate, which I think there might be some good ways to interpret that and some bad ways. But the, the right. assumption for most Western is that means we have to be doing something. Yeah, of course. And, and you know, the, the, the simplest response I would give to that is the best way that you can help people participate in the liturgy is by giving them something worthwhile to contemplate rather than just giving them more stuff to do. Right. Because, um, well, let's put it this way, right? Aristotle said that the highest activity of man is contemplation, okay? And that's true. And the Catholic tradition completely endorses that and took that up. Um, so the, the, what's, what's paradoxical is that because modern Western people are so activistic and we're so Pelagian, really, we, we think that we can build a better world, we can gain our own salvation by our own works. You know, there are all kinds of ways in which we are heretics um, by, by thinking that we're in charge and we should be the ones building and doing everything, that we, we tend to forget that it's a privilege for the lay people to be ministered unto, okay? And that the clergy have a burden. It's a burden. I mean, I know a lot of priests and I know bishops, and they tell me when they are fully loaded up with all of their gear and they're going through like a two hour solemn liturgy, it's a lot of work for them. They're sweating, you know, they're, they might be suffering. It's not, they have to stand a lot. You know, they have to remember a million things. And I, as a layman, I get to sit there and I get to relish all of it and absorb it and just be edified and be raised up to heavenly thoughts and, you know, and, and pray, you know, I mean, it's, it's what a privilege for lay people. So it's kind of absurd. Um, I mean, I think it's because we have an absurd um, misunderstanding of the relationship between activity and contemplation that we, that we even have this problem of what active participation is. But to be more specific, right, um, what lay people need to practice is active receptivity, right? That is to say, the, the best thing for us as human beings is to receive divine gifts, and that's even true for the clergy. What makes the clergy uh, clergy is that they can give divine gifts. But what makes them holy is that they can receive divine gifts, right? That's what makes everybody holy, uh, right. not doing, but, but receiving. And so what participation fundamentally means is learning how to receive well what the church, what Christ and the church and the liturgy wish to give us, right? right. Um, and if we, if we had that perspective on it, this whole discussion of ministry would change. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I just want to, um, you're, you're, the book is great. And I, 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 we could go on for five hours, but we're not going to. I, one thing I really liked about though, is the, the last section, I think it's the last section, right? Yeah. Section uh, three is restoration mm -hmm. because the, the fact is, is that we are so far mm -hmm. from what, what you're talking about. Let's be honest in your, in your typical parish, we know this, even in your quote unquote good parishes, we are so far from this. So mm -hmm. what practical steps you talk about in the book, but let's talk about here a little bit. What are some practical steps we can take that can help to bring us back to this? Now, obviously you and I probably, we know both know one answer we would give is, okay, let's just have the traditional Latin mass everywhere. Okay. But let's say, let's be realistic to, to the, the times we live in, in the church we're in right now. Mm -hmm. What practically can, for example, a parish do, can a parish priest, can a lay person a parish do, can, can the church do on, on like maybe baby steps to start to get back to this idea of the clear delineation, both between lay and cleric and the delineation between male and female? What are some things we can do? So, I mean, there are two levels to this answer. The, 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 the one level is if you are living in a good diocese with a reasonable bishop who has a clue about anything, and and you're not at, Chicago. OK, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so and, and if you're if you're a priest um, at, a, at a parish that's conservative, where people are open to learning about the traditions of the church and you don't have like a feminist cabal that is out to get you, whatever, then, of course, it's possible. There are many things that can be done. The architecture of the church, if you're building a new church or renovating a church, you can emphasize the architectural uh, articulations that I was talking about earlier, you can make sure that you only have men, uh, not just boys, by the way, but also men serving in the sanctuary in cassock and surplus, right? You can not use extraordinary ministers of the community. In fact, in fact, I've written about this extensively. The, the church says about a hundred times that extraordinary ministers should usually not be used. Uh, that is, that's why they're extraordinary. And so 
from a, from a canonical point of view, a pastor has, you know, has uh, countless arguments he can make to people as to why he should, he shouldn't have these, these extraordinary ministers. Um, so again, I'm just saying in terms of, you know, and then women can veil in the congregation, right? Because in a parish like the one that I'm talking about, this hypothetical parish, uh, you know, people wouldn't look askance at women for veiling. Um, and why is veiling important? Well, I have a whole chapter in the book on that. But but the short answer is it actually is a sign of the dignity of being a woman in her place in the cosmos and in the church. Um, and it's a sign of her of her sacredness and the reverence that is owed to the sacred liturgy at which in which she's participating. Um, so, you know, there these are the sort of little steps. And of course, the music, you know, could be if the music is truly sacred, um, if it's if it's chant and polyphony, for example, uh, and hymns with orthodox lyrics, then all of these are going to be ways, sort of catechetical ways that will form the imaginations and the hearts and the minds of the people who attend mass in such a place. And they will start to think in more traditional terms about everybody's role, about the clergy's role, about uh, even the, the, the quasi clergy, that is to say, those who are substituting for clergy, but dressed in, in a clerical manner, um, about their, themselves as laity, about themselves as men and women. Um, all of that will begin to happen. But that's one layer of answer. The other layer of answer is we have to be honest about the fact that we're dealing with a massive confrontation in the church between, I'm going to call it progressivism and traditionalism, okay? And I think in the, at the end of the day, there's not going to be any other position left. It's going to be progressivism, which is a, a form of modernism, and there's going to be traditionalism, which is let's hold on to, let's hold fast to what the church has always done and always believed. Um, up to this period of chaos around and after the Second Vatican Council. Um, and I think that the way that this dichotomy or this, um, this, this opposition is going to play out is that dioceses are going to become more and more friendly either to progressivism or to traditionalism. And in the end, um, we need the traditional Latin mass to show us the way to be traditional and to think about the roles of clergy and laity and men and women in a traditional way. We, we're not gonna be able to get that out of the stuff that came in the past 50 years. It's right. too full of confusion. It's too full of contradictions. It's too full of ambiguities. Um, it's too full of the culture that, that we're, that we're you know, swimming against. Um, so I think we need the tradition as a kind of North star to, got, to guide us. Otherwise we're really lost. Which, you know, the idea of tradition as the North Star is just the, a fundamental Catholic principle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just that, that's what that's what Catholics have hopefully been saying yeah. forever. Okay, I think I'm gonna we're gonna wrap it up here because we're getting a little bit long. But this is this has been great. Like I said, I would just basically I'm hoping this is a tease for people to read the book Ministers of Christ because, I mean, he goes in Peter goes into all these uh, with a very, very in depth. I mean, what, what is this? Two hundred fifty pages worth. And as all as all Peter's books are, it's very readable, very easy to read. Um, Layla Lawler has a great uh, forward to the book, um, which, which kind of sets the table, I think. And so I just recommend people get the book. Um, and and Peter, just so you have a chance, we have a chance here. Where are some places that people can find out about <laughs> all the stuff that you all the stuff that you're involved in doing? Uh, well, I mean, if if I wasn't so technologically incompetent. I would probably have like a fancy website with all my new articles and things, but I don't have that. I just, I have a website that lists my books and some of my articles and, and tells, and tells people how to contact me by email. Um, but otherwise, you know, you just, just keep an eye on new liturgical movement every Monday. I've been publishing there for, I don't know, seven years now. And uh, every Wednesday at one Peter five, um, I also almost every Wednesday, there's a piece by me up there. Uh, and those are my two, those are the two main places I write. So if you're it's a new liturgical movement and at one Peter five, one Peter five, of course, our sister publication. So we exactly. want to promote that obviously. Uh, and you know, you write for crisis sometimes and I, I know other places as well. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you got to follow Peter's page. You've already Abol uh, completely obliterated the five thousand friend limit, right? On your personal. <laughs> yes, but I have I have a a, a public profile. Right. I think is what they call it. Yeah, a public page. I think. Yeah. Them. So you can, if you're on Facebook, you can follow uh, Peter there as well. But go to a site. I'll link to all this stuff on the okay. um, cool. in the show notes so people can can go to it. So, okay, everybody, thank you again, Peter. I appreciate you uh, joining us and uh, encourage everybody to buy the book and check out Peter's other works elsewhere. Okay, everybody, until next time, God love you. 